Hello, and welcome to ADCES's podcast, The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. In each episode, we speak with guests from across the diabetes care space to bring you perspectives, issues, and updates that elevate your role, inform your practice, and ignite your passion. I'm Kirsten Yale, the Research Manager at the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Our guest today is Sandra Rodriguez, the Capacity Development Coordinator at Project Vita Health Center in El Paso, Texas. For over 20 years, this site has been serving local communities of mostly Hispanic and Latino individuals who, according to the CDC, are twice as likely to develop type 2 diabetes compared to their non-Hispanic white counterparts. Sandra will share some of the innovative ways her program engages with a local community and clients to provide services that support health by addressing the body, mind, and spirit of the individual. Sandra, welcome to the huddle. Hi, Kirsten. Thank you. It's great to be here with you today. Well, it's great to have you. And we are so happy you're here to talk with us about your program, you know, Project Vita Health Center down in El Paso. You know, you guys have been such great collaborators with us here at ADCES on the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And, you know, I know we've actually learned so much from your group and what you do. And we've been able to apply, you know, a lot of those principles to the work we do with the broader um, groups that we work with through the CDC on the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, so number one, thank you for that. Um, and then number two, I, I know you pretty well, but I would love for our listeners to get a chance to um, know you and hear a little bit about Project Vita Health Center and what you guys do down there in El Paso. Sure. Thank you, Kirsten, for that uh, introduction. So my name is Sandra Rodriguez. I've been with Project Vida Health Center for 10 years already, you know, in, in different roles. I'm currently the capacity development coordinator, but I was before this the diabetes prevention coordinator. To talk a little bit about who we are as an organization, Project Vida Health Center is a multifaceted organization. We're an FQHC, a federally qualified health center. And we have an integrated model of care where we work, uh, we have primary care, behavioral health, dental services, and then we have our sister organization, which is our social services wing, which provides just this gamut of services to our community. And our diabetes prevention program that we have in collaboration with ADCES has been in place for the last three years already. And it has been a great success with with our Latinx community. And so that's what we're here to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, and you guys have been around for a long time, right? Yes. As an organization, we've been around for over 20 years. You know, the way this organization started, it was just basically having coffee with the neighbors. Our directors, which are still in the organization with us, they envisioned to provide services in areas that were underserved. So they basically went down, they had conversations with the community, they tried to understand what those needs were to ensure that whatever those services were, were brought to their community were those that were actually needed. And so it was a series of conversations, you know, hosting community congresses, uh, and that's basically how we started. Where where did the decision to do these coffees come from? Because it's such a great idea and the fact that you guys have been doing these for so long and they've um, really driven your program over the years. How did this great spark of an idea happen? Our directors currently, they they still have this vision that the experts in whatever is happening is the actual individual. So they, you know, they had done a lot of work in different parts of the country and even, you know, in Central America, they did a lot of work in Chicago. And when they came to El Paso, they, they wanted to ensure that they were hearing those voices of those individuals. And so that's how it started. Every time we tried to provide services in different areas and we expand we ensure that we always hear those voices, you know, that we have these conversations, that we talk again about how is it that you see your community in the next five years? What are some barriers that could potentially maybe hinder you from getting there? And then 
And then at the end, we do a call to action. What can you do as a community and as an individual to try and get to those goals, right? And so it's a lot of, it's not just conversation, but it's also empowerment. And I would say it's also that call to action with them feeling like an organization is there to, to help them and try to, to guide them to where it is that they want to see their community. So I love to hear you say, or when you, you said a, a couple minutes ago, that this is something that your founders did not just in El Paso, but in South America. So really went back to, to sort of understand how how do how do we best engage people and really respect people and their and their cultures in order to engage them. In, in that last question you asked when you walked through, how would you like to see your community in three years? What are some of the barriers and what can we do? That question, what can we do? Where do we go from there or where, where have you gone from there? So over the years, we've done work in traditional ways and then we've learned our lessons. There's always this learning curve. And we've identified when we started, when we adopted this wellness approach, About, I would say, five to six years ago in the programs that we have under the Outreach and Wellness Department, we identified something else was needed. Yes, we were providing education. We were accessing individuals to healthcare. We were creating awareness, but something wasn't working. There was something missing. And so when we adventured into uh, this wellness approach and this framework, we saw this difference in the response from our community. And it even impacted the work that we do as professionals, but it also impacts you as an individual, you as a service provider. And so we continue to implement this wellness approach with with every program that, that we have within our outreach and wellness. And basically, you know, this wellness approach is a holistic approach to health that sees the individual as a whole person. And it's a strength-based approach that incorporates body, mind, and spirit, trying to aim at balance. And we know that balance might look different for different people. And we don't try to say that wellness is the absence of, of a medical condition, right, of a disease or an illness or stress, but it's really working towards having that, that balance, creating this purpose in life. You know, where the individual is satisfied with what they do, with, with their work, or with their interactions, that they're able to create connections and social interactions. So it's, I, I understand that it's a very broad concept, but I think the key thing here is that it focuses on the individual. Well, it's, it's really in line with the direction that ADCES is going with its vision. So that idea of individualized care and now moving sort of more in line to your idea of body, mind, and spirit, which is person-centered care. And that the body, mind, and spirit, I think, creates this visual or this picture for us. But there's so much that drives the body, mind, and spirit in the environment and who a person is. And that drives their their self-care, right? How did you incorporate this into your model or the population that you're working with? So one of the biggest things that we realized is that one, we need to create that awareness around wellness within your community, right? And with those individuals that you're serving. So one is educating them on what wellness is and having them realize that this is There is self-responsibility and and self-accountability when we talk about wellness and that they understand this. It's understanding that wellness incorporates different dimensions and how do we help them optimize this health, right? We know that it includes emotional, spiritual, intellectual, physical, environmental, financial, occupational, and social. Those are the eight dimensions. And then how do we move forward once we've educated them and created that awareness is ensuring that we identify what are those needs that the individual has. We understand that there might be some challenges along the way for the individual to be successful in the interventions that we're having with them. If it's, if it's education, right. Or if it's uh, of whatever uh, type of education for diabetes prevention or 
education on diabetes management. So the idea is that we identify those those areas and we help the individual to tackle those. We do a social determinants of health assessment initially to our participants where you know we're able to identify what those challenges are some some for example could be transportation issues or some could be uh, food insecurity for example and if you're talking about doing education on healthy eating but that individual doesn't have access to the ideal types of foods and how do you get that individual there so it's assessing and identifying to be able to act upon it and see what actions you need to do. If you need to refer the individual, if you have the opportunity to provide those services within your organization, that is great. But if you don't, where do you refer them to? And so it's also ensuring that you have this net of organizations that is able to provide those services to to your community. It's really interesting to hear you talk about the individualized care, the person-centered care. And then something that I've been really interested in lately is that person-centered care in relation to population health and community health. And where where do we start? And you've talked about the traditional ways of programming in the community. Do, do they work for your clients? They need some enhancements. We've identified that these traditional ways can be challenging and they might not help us reach the majority of our population. But if we understand that there is an opportunity to enhance what we're doing, I think that would greatly benefit our patient population and the individuals that we serve. So this is almost a great transition into a discussion we had last week, which I love so much, which was talking about virtual modality and how COVID affected the work that you do. So when you're talking about reaching a broader population and working with new technology and how to reach that population, you have some some great stories here, right? Yes, definitely. I don't know if a lot of organizations and individuals felt this way, but when COVID came about a few months ago, we said, we're not going to be able to provide services. Like there's no way we're going to be able to have our our patients and our clients uh, connect in this virtual world. That's what we thought. That was our first thought. But then we said, okay, wait, we need to get creative. How can we reach them? They still have needs. They, They still need to feel connected. So what can we do? And so really exploring this new virtual modality has has really been a great learning experience for us. You know, we've identified that it's it has been very successful within our communities. Yes, there has to be additional steps that you need to take. You need to educate them on how to use their their devices, but the majority now have smartphones. So there's this opportunity for you to teach them how to connect. And then once you get to that, then you're able to provide the interventions that you would normally on a face-to-face, but through a virtual modality. What we've seen is that in the past, when we provide services for our communities and we say, okay, we're going to have these classes, you know, and they're free and then We don't have that attendance that we wish we had all the time, right? And so there's different barriers. You know, it could be transportation. It could be some individuals are the primary caretakers of a family member. And so this this is a challenge. And so with this virtual modality, those barriers have eliminated. I mean, we're able to connect with the individual that couldn't make it to class because they were out of work super late and from the time... They would commute to our facilities. You know, it was it was just too much and they weren't willing to do that. You know, and same thing for for those primary caretakers. They had to find someone else to to look after their loved ones. And so this ability to be able to connect with them where they're at eliminates all those barriers, you know, and and we're able to engage with them uh, within their own environment. And it has helped us also to understand their backgrounds, you know, where they're coming from and what challenges they face on the day to day. And so it has been a great learning opportunity for us. 
so much that now we can't envision doing this program without this virtual modality. If we were to move forward and say, in a few months, in a year, we, were, we would be able to go back to face-to-face, -face, we would keep this virtual modality as an additional way to connect with individuals. And so you took the words right out of my mouth there. I, even though COVID has been really terrible and, and hard on the population, there's been some good things that have come out of it, like this opportunity to implement virtual modalities pretty quickly. And it sounds like you have some some um, members of your population actually work better on virtual modalities. Yes. You know, it is no secret that uh, reaching our male population is, is a challenge. You know, they have competing priorities. And so it, it becomes a challenge when you try to focus and providing services to them. However, you know, we've been very successful with, with some of our participants that are male in our program. And you know, to give you an example, we have an individual that has been engaged for the last six months in our virtual modality program, and he has already lost 30 pounds. And that's just in, you know, six months of this, uh, of this intervention. And then again, it goes back to, we eliminated that barrier for this individual, because now he's able to attend even when he's tired, right after work, but he's, he has the ability to connect. And then having the ability to educate him on wellness and understand how one area can impact another uh, has been, you know, has, has been great because we, we see the impact on this individual. 30 pounds sounds like a big number, but think about the benefits and the health of that individual. And the benefits of so many more following him if they can follow the same program. So the impact can be you know, exponential when we think about it. And, and, you know, Sandra, that brings me to start thinking about, so we, kn we know this works. Um, we know that the community engagement approach that you guys do works. We know that now you guys have implemented this virtual modality and this works and you're doing, there's really great possibilities here. Um, how do you fund programs like this? Being a nonprofit, that's something that is always on the back of our head. And how do we sustain programs and how do we ensure that these services continue to be provided to our communities? And so one of the biggest things for us is grant funding. While we wish that a lot of these interventions were sustainable, sometimes it takes time to get there. We've explored different avenues, specifically with the Diabetes Prevention Program, uh, we've explored reimbursement and we were successful with it with when we did uh, this program with employers, you know, but it takes time to build that relationship and it takes time for them to want to invest as well. And so grant funding has really been kind of that backbone of our organization. And, you know, one of the biggest things that we do is ensure that Whenever we apply to a grant, we tell our story of who we are, of our characteristics within the services that we provide. We really emphasize a promotora model, which is a community health worker uh, model. And this is something that has really worked for us. You know, if you tell your story, if you are very specific in saying how you do the work that you do, and, and you do it through data, you know, you're able to tell that story with the data that you've collected. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity for you to get funded in different programs, not just diabetes prevention, but it could be anything from teen pregnancy prevention to diabetes education. And then it's tapping into your local state and federal funding that is out there, you know, which there's, there's great opportunity. Yes, it's very competitive. But again, if you tell your story, if you talk about the models that you use and it's data driven, you have great opportunities to continue to get funded. Yeah, th those are great tips for, for our listeners. It's almost like um, the grant funding gives you the startup funding that you need to create a sustainable model. And I think in our show notes, you're sharing some of your, that what I love that maybe our listeners could could gain from this is, you know, your sustainable models that you've learned at, from from the grant funding you've had 
apply the sustainable models? And then can we share those to a broader audience to use those sustainable models? So not everybody across the United States in little pockets is doing the same thing, right? We can grow so much faster if we share. Yes, that is correct. So, you know, one of the things that this sustainable model, what what has worked for us is what I was mentioning earlier, which is the promotora approach or the community health worker approach. We know that the individual that does this type of work is an individual that comes from that community that is able to build trusting relationships from the community and and is identified, you know, as someone that is trustworthy. And so the doors open up when you have an individual like this, you know, and then most importantly, that there is collaboration between your educators or community health workers and your medical providers. I think that's where you could see the biggest success. And how do you collaborate with each other? It's simple, you know, well, I guess it's, easier said than done sometimes, but having that constant communication with your medical providers, informing them of the programs that you're currently implementing, informing them of dates and times and letting them know what is it that you need from them to help, uh, to help us get those patients to our spaces, you know, where we're able to educate them and create that awareness. And so it's working with each other they include education as part of their treatment plan. And so they recommend these sessions to their, to their patients. And it's different, you know, when the, when the community member or the patient receives this from initially, right, from their medical provider, and then they receive that phone call from the educator or the community health worker inviting them to sessions and stating, you know, the first thing we say is, hi, good morning. We're inviting you to these classes. Your medical provider suggested this as part of your treatment plan. And so it's seen different. There's more engagement. You know, there's that collaboration that is ongoing between that medical provider and the community health worker. And if you think about it, the community health worker is that bridge, that bridge to connect the individual to the medical provider and to access health care at the same time, educating them uh, and creating that awareness around uh, the medical condition that they are experiencing or just around health. Yeah. And, and just listening to you, it just is this constant reminder to me that that open, non-judgmental communication, that constantly listening is that thing that's going to put us like a million miles ahead it's something that we can do in five minutes that will put us a million miles ahead. Sandra, I hate to do this, but we're getting to the part of the program that I hate, which is the end. Um, what, what were some what are some ideas you could share with our listeners to maybe help them with their programs? I would say meet your patients and your clients where they're at. How do you do this? There's different ways. One could be identifying and addressing your social determinants of health, capturing it. On, on paper and this way, that's going to be your roadmap, right? As to what are those challenges that you're going to tackle with this individual and it's going to help you be more successful with whatever intervention it is you're doing from, from prevention, education, or even treatment. And then next is develop a tool that makes sense to you. There's a lot of tools out there, you know, that can help you identify barriers, but you can create one that makes sense for you. Another thing that is important is always collect data, collect data, data, data. That's the way you're going to tell your story. It's going to help you in many different ways. One, to analyze the impact of what you're doing, to tell your story to partners, you know, if you're hoping to expand this, to be able to apply to grants, you know, you're going to have that um, data that will be able to to show the type of work that you do. So I think those would be the biggest things that I would share with all of you. I love that you ended with data and data telling a story because that's always my mantra. Don't just throw numbers out there. 
ask the questions of the data and let the data tell the story and then share that story. If I can share, this has just been an incredible conversation. You know, I think my takeaways about building, trusting, and engaging relationships with the community and and also that big piece that we started with, and I think you weaved all the way throughout, which is respecting and listening to the people in the community and their body, mind, and spirit. So that is what I am going to be remembering this week. Thank you, Kirsten. This has been great. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. As we just heard from Sandra, Project Vita has been able to sustain its support of local, primarily Hispanic and Latino communities for over 20 years through a person-centered model of care that integrates community health workers, needs assessments, and individualized support. By capturing key metrics and data on the populations they serve and the improved health outcomes they deliver, they've been able to sustain funding and grow their positive impact. If you're wondering how you can address racial equity in your practice, Sandra outlined some critical first steps. First, make sure to collect demographic data of your clients to have a better understanding of who you're serving. Next, develop an assessment tool that looks at each client's unique challenges that may present barriers to the care you provide. We've uploaded a template for you that you can use in our show notes at diabeteseducator.org forward slash podcast. Finally, identify and address the social determinants of health that affect your clients and your community. Make sure you capture and track these on paper so you can intervene when appropriate and measure the effectiveness of your interventions. If you're interested in accessing more information and education on racial equity in healthcare, check out the on-demand sessions of the virtual ADCES 20 annual conference. When you register at adces20.org, you will have immediate access to 36 CE and 69 sessions on important topics in diabetes care and education, such as racial equity, clinical integration, technology and behavioral health, plus late-breaking research sessions. Access special pricing by becoming a member at diabeteseducator.org forward slash join. The information in this podcast is for informational purposes only and may not be appropriate or applicable for your individual circumstances. This podcast does not provide medical or professional advice and is not a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.